Welcome to the Brains Magazine podcast, a podcast with in-depth interviews and conversations with world-class entrepreneurs, expert coaches, industry leaders, and international celebrities. Get exclusive insight into the world of business, mindset, leadership, and lifestyle with your host, Mark Sefton. want to welcome you to this next episode of the brains magazine podcast and today we have amy armstrong amy is developing pros into really high impact coaches alongside this amy is really passionate about co-parenting coaching and being a mediator within all things around the family unit amy it's great to have you with us today on today's show thank you mark i feel welcome Good, you should. I, I I love it. I mean, what a privilege it is for me to be mm. able to meet people like you. And then I'm I'm always fascinated by human behavior, always fascinated by why people do what they do. Um, and I think that's probably a good start, actually, Amy, is to mm. ask you not what you do, but why do you do it? Mm-hmm. Mark, there's so often a disconnect between what people say is important to them and the way they behave. And this is what has come to light so much for me as I've worked with families and now people in lots of situations where there's conflict is they feel one way and they behave another way. Mm. And this disconnect creates not only turmoil, but a lot of suffering, not only for the the person, but really for everyone around them. Mm. And why, why do you think it is then, Amy, that people are uh, saying one thing but actually mean, mean another? Because that's not helpful for anybody. It's not helpful for anyone. And I think the reason people do it is twofold. One is we fall into a lot of really bad habits. And we function out of habit rather than intentionality. And the other reason is we're simply just not aware of what's really true for us. And so we behave in ways that we think are going to be socially acceptable, or we think we're going to get our needs met when we really just aren't aware that maybe we have a need that we don't even know about. Mm. And self-awareness for me, I, mm-hmm. I always bring it front and center Mm-hmm. For me, when people say, you know, what's the most important skill to have? For me, it's this one, because without knowing who you are and without knowing actually what's tripping you up, without being able to shine the light on actually this is where I need to get healing, this is where I need to get a different perspective, mm-hmm. we can't we can't advance, can we? We absolutely can't. And we often trick ourselves into thinking we can, and we keep trying the same old thing that doesn't get us where we want to go. Mm. It's sad, really. It is. But then we have people like you, Amy, that are that mm. are making little, little inroads to get people thinking differently. Um, because, you know, you talked about our behavior, but often it's true that our beliefs determine our behavior. But if we don't know what we believe, which again comes back to self-awareness, back to mm. actual connection with self, so you're talking about really the disconnect between the head and the heart there's a conflict there and it's bringing those two together uh, exactly. and then you know and then people working with you you're able to then help them think differently which then helps them you know take a different approach mm-hmm. exactly and the first thing we do is help them think differently about themselves right because it's really our feelings and our thoughts and our beliefs all working together sometimes really can work against us. Mm. And we want to first become aware of how we see ourselves, the importance of our identity so that we can start to align our behaviors with who we are and who we really want to be. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now I know that you are a big believer in how powerful our words are. Why why do you Mm -hmm. believe that positive words have an incredible impact on our human psyche. So much of our daily life, our behavior is centered around how we're interpreting what's going on around us. 
So words not only have meaning, but they have different meaning to different people. Mm. So I have a video on my website uh, where th- I'm in an interview where I say, I really don't like the word help because sometimes it makes people feel helpless if I say they need help or when they're coming for help. And so I like to support people rather than help them or be a resource for them rather than help them. So do I help them? Absolutely. There's a lot of times I love that word. It's just, I want to be careful what it means to that person in that context. So that's just one example of how words can really shift the way someone sees themselves in relation to their, really to their power of how they can change their world. I like that you you touch upon that because that's something that I've been mindful of as well is actually my understanding of a word could land completely differently to you. Like, for example, I personally don't like the word life coach, even though <laughs> I've got a diploma in life coaching, right? But you'll never see it anywhere. Right. And this, okay. may be a, this may be a Mac thing. This may be an English thing. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe it's neither of those. But for me, it doesn't resonate because... When I think of life coach, it almost comes across as quite condescending, almost mm-hmm. like somebody's going to work with me where I'm portraying or the title portrays, you know, that I've got life kind of, you know, under wraps and people are paying I'll me. Figured to out. Them. Yeah. <laughs> and help help other people like live their life better. And I'm thinking, you know, I am a work in progress too. Like there's still things in my life that need further healing need further exploration, you know, and I'm very much, you know, a master of what I believe in. Uh, So believe that, you know, it is hard to see the picture when you're in the frame. I'm a big believer in in getting other Mm -hmm. perspectives and and challenging us. So I love the fact that you've talked about actually the meaning that we give to words and how they can be different for other people, because I do think that's really important. Very much. And, And as a professional coach, even working with other professionals as well as clients about coaching, really having that conversation first about the interplay between expertise and self-discovery that is the hallmark of coaching is so important for people to understand that this is their life, their work. And a coach is a good coach when they're good at asking questions and using that inquiry and feedback and observation to then support the client rather than letting that expertise get in the way. Mm. Yeah. And you sound like a great, you sound like a great coach, Amy, Mm. really, because it, it seems like you've managed or you manage to be present, nurturing and challenging all at the same time. Like how, how have you managed to kind of find that sweet spot? Actually, it comes from my own experience being coached. So I spent the first 45 years of my life in a world that really was not very authentic. Mm. And I was in a lot of pain. And someone, dear friend, uh, who is now a coach, was able to meet me there. I knew she loved me. She was very warm and she was very kind, but she was able to start pointing out some of the incongruence between what I was saying and what I was doing. Mm. And she was able to point out that I was trying to orchestrate my life rather than live my life. And so I had that experience where I actually felt more cared for because she challenged me. Mm. And in a lot of workplaces, in families, in a lot of our relationships, you know, we try to be good people, we try to be kind, and we're actually kind of ripping people off, because we're not giving them feedback about the impact they're having on us. And so it actually becomes a more kind, more loving approach, when we can in supportive relationships where the person is open and inviting feedback, to learn to give feedback about their impact. And it it actually comes across as a as the most loving gesture. Mm. Rather than just staying on the surface with people. Yeah, it's I I totally vibe with that, Amy, because it's people need to hear 
people the truth yeah and mm -hmm. and they also need to hear what they don't want to hear but but is mm -hmm. necessary you know tell people what they mm -hmm. need to hear not what they want to hear and we do it out of support for their goals right so when we know someone and we've taken the time to understand their values, their needs, their vision, mm. then we can frame the feedback in terms of where they want to go. Mm. So we're not giving feedback so that, you know, it, it advances our goals as much as we're giving feedback because it advances their goals. And mm. so they get a sense of true partnership that we genuinely have heard them and care about what's important to them. And the feedback can help them have the kind of day, the kind of life that they really want to have. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of discipline. Now, when again, this is a great example again of, of meaning we give to words, because when people mm -hmm. hear the word discipline, they hear punishment. Whereas for me, when I say the word discipline, it's to correct something mm -hmm. uh, that isn't right. Like it's, a, it's an adjustment. Well, the uh, word discipline actually comes from a Latin word meaning to teach. Exactly. Right? So yeah. it's really all about learning. Mm. Um, which is which is interesting, isn't it? Because I do think that in society we're quite defensive, and then uh, actually it's quite liberating to go back to the root meaning of of words. I'm always mm -hmm. fascinated by mm -hmm. by that. What I find in working in really high conflict situations, where sometimes there's been violence, there's been um, high stakes threats, financial threats, definite threats to the family. What I find is that people are so fear-based, of course, right? Because that's how our brains are wired to keep us safe and our nervous systems are trying to keep us safe. But a coach can actually help help them regulate through this, this co-regulation process that coaching invites where they can feel so supported in their fear, right? We don't ever tell them to change how they feel. We just join them. They're validating, understanding, helping them understand that their fear makes sense. And then they're able to see that there's actually more to the situation than what their fear is telling them. And that's where we can step in as a friend, as a coach, as a coworker, as a family member, and hear what they want instead of what they're experiencing mm. and just really help them start to see their power to create a different experience. Mm. Love that. Now you believe a coach's approach is more effective to positive change. Like what, what do you, what do you really mean by that? Amy, and how does that how does that work? Right. I really see coaching as the go-to intervention for change. So what I do is always focused on transformation. And my definition of transformation is a change in perspective that results in a change in behavior. So many of our conversations, what we read, podcasts we might hear, great information. We might love it. We might be able to talk about it, be really excited about it. But if it doesn't result in new habits that we integrate into our life, it's it's learning, it's intellectual, but it's not transformational. Mm. So I like to look at um, what I learned in my social work training is second order change. We're looking for change that really changes the rules. It changes the frame in which we're operating. So we're not just doing more of something or less of something, but we truly change the way we see it. And then it allows us to be a very different catalyst for change with people around us or in our own careers or families. Yeah. Love that. Love that, Amy. I, the way that the way that you see things, and I think the way that you capture the empathy as well as mm -hmm. actually you've talked about a little bit we kind of do people a disservice when we don't tell people what they need to hear it's almost like you know being challenged for you actually says to you that this person cares mm -hmm. you know and uh 
and then the importance of validating how, how they feel within that. And I think your understanding of coaching is very beautiful and can see how, mm. how that really has become pivotal. Thank you. The other side, Amy, of something that you that you do is obviously you're a co-parenting coach and you're a family mediator. And this this side of things kind of interested me as well with regards mm-hmm. to you. Um, even my own own journey, you know, my parents divorced when I was eight. So I kind of uh, understood some of the, the fallout and the journey I've had to go on, even as an adult of, you know, mm-hmm. childhood trauma based on that. Mm-hmm. And then me actually going through a divorce as well, having three children and then how, how they've kind of gone through it and how I've been able to go through that with them. Wow. So obviously when, when I think about the work that you do, you know, you've dedicated, you know, a lot of time in developing the behaviors that support children during and after divorce. And I, I'm just fascinated by this. Why is this something that has become so important to you? Um, And actually I think, unfortunately, in the world we live in, it's like it's pretty common now to get divorced. I think it's one in two marriages end in divorce, and unfortunately, children are often the the innocent part in that. Right. Um, so there's a lot there. So I should be quiet. Let you let you answer. <laughs> there's a lot there, and I'd love to ask you more. You know, I would love to hear more about your experience. I know when I divorced, I watched my three children and just watched how hurt they were when I wasn't doing my own work for healing. And it was very obvious to me then that the best thing I could do for my three children was to take really good care of myself, to be happy, to show them that, of course, we can handle this. Of course, we can manage this. Let's tap into whatever resources would I what that we need. Let's take good care of ourselves. Let's talk. Let's laugh. Let's you know do fun things, and and really demonstrate that we are in control of our lives, even when circumstances present themselves that are undesirable. We do not need to be directed just by what's going on outside of us. We want to be directed by what's going on inside of us. And so I have, I have natural empathy, but even more than that, I have a lot of curiosity. Mm -hmm. And so I think what happened is I saw my three children each have different needs when their dad and I were splitting up and we were separated for a while before we even decided to divorce. And I saw them need different things. One of my daughters wanted to see her parents together. She wanted to have dinner with all of us together. The other one preferred mom and dad not be in the same room. She felt more relaxed when we weren't together. And that was, you know, we were more able to meet her needs by doing things separately. And my son just really needed his routines. As long as he kept his routines, he didn't really need to worry about what was going on between mom and dad. So watching them, I thought was really interesting to see how different they were And then I watched what happened to them as I started doing my own healing work. And the more able I was to be true and authentic, the more they were able to relax and trust that I was taking care of myself and they could take care of themselves. And we could all talk and make requests of whatever we needed from each other without being overly dependent on each other. Mm. And and we know, Amy, don't we, that children are mirrors. Um, (laughs) And they re- they often reflect behaviors that that right. we actually demonstrate. And I can right. think I can think back out of m- numerous times where I had conversations with my kids, or I'm getting frustrated with my son because he's testing the boundaries. And then I realize, you know, he has a father in me who is always testing boundaries. Mm. And, then I, and then I'm wondering, you know, why why he's not complying? And I'm thinking, well, that's because of you, Mark. You have to take <laughs> you you have to take that. <laughs> Well, I will say you've already mentioned that you are committed to your own healing. And that's really the the sign for your child that this is the work of our lives is to keep healing, keep growing, keep learning, keep trying new things. And you mentioned one of my favorite words, which is boundaries. Mm. And I know that word is loaded 
and has a, a meaning for a lot of people that's actually quite prickly or cold or even a little scary. And a lot of the work I do with people is around setting foolproof boundaries that we actually set in a gentle, confident manner, right? I, I call it the power, excuse, it's the power paradox where we often behave in ways that is giving away our power when we feel the least powerful, right? So a lot of people that come across with a loud voice and big movements and interrupting and come on really strong, it's actually because they're feeling weaker on the inside. So I help people make that shift to gain the confidence on the inside of where the boundaries really need to be and then present them with confidence and calm so that the 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 power really resides in the individual rather than expecting our power to come from other people doing what we think they should do. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I think, I mean, again, we it's so funny because we've got so many examples now of what you said at the start about right. words and the meaning we give to things. And whenever I heard hear a word like boundaries, it's always fascinating for me because most people talk about boundaries in the sense of keeping things out. But when I think of like a fence, it isn't just about keeping things out. It's about keeping things in. Exactly. And, I, and actually it's the, it's the, it's, that's the bit where I feel is lacking uh, that we need to talk about that more. Uh, the importance of boundaries to keep the right things in and not mm -hmm. emphasize so much about boundaries, keeping things out. Exactly. What's your thoughts on that? The, light, the boundaries are the, the ring light that we put on ourselves to shine on what we want to keep. Mm. And I like to think of it as pro me, never anti you. We simply can't control what's outside of us, except by controlling what's inside of us. Right? I'm going to have a much better experience on the outside once I'm having the kind of experience I want to have on the inside. Mm. And so that boundary is the light that reminds mm. us of who we are, who we want to be, what's true for us, and exactly how you said it, what we want to keep in. Mm. Why is it important mm -hmm. then, Amy, that we find a resolution to difficult challenges in our life? Why, why, why is it important that we actually look for a resolve rather than just kind of brushing it under the carpet? Mm -hmm. Everyone is different. Certainly everyone's different. I do find that overwhelmingly a universal desire is to have some sense of ease, some sense of calm, some sense of peace on the inside. People choose different words to describe it. I do find that to be a pretty common experience though. People don't want to lie awake at night thinking of a hundred different things that they can't control. We want to have a sense that all is well. So resolving conflict means that we're going to find the specific way to create the ease, the calm, the peace that helps us sleep well at night. Mm. Yeah, because I, for me, I mean, my idea of success is being at peace with myself. Mm. And I think, but people have a weird understanding of what peace really is. Sometimes people <laughs> think peace is being quiet and it isn't always, is it? Mm. Well, I'm someone who likes a lot of adventure. I like to be doing a variety of things every day. I like a lot going on. I don't need quiet necessarily. I do like certain quiet moments, but we can all be very different with our preferences, with our interests. Obviously our personalities are very different, but that sense, that deep sense that all is well, resides deep down inside us and i do find that however you however you phrase it it's there for all of us this this deep longing the longing i i typically see that it's tied to connection when we feel connected with ourselves and connected in some type of community we're much more likely to feel that deep sense that all is well inside of ourselves that's very true very true what are some of your top tips then, Amy, on how to help us find a resolution, you know, regarding a problem? Is there some things that you kind of feel that you can share with us? Definitely. I will start with my 
Absolute favorite top tip. People try to achieve ease or calm when things are really heated. And the habits that we have when things are good are the same habits that we're going to have when things are really heated. So if we can practice better habits when we're calm, for example, doing some self-awareness work, um, even if it's a walking meditation or some way of checking in to see how calm or connected we're feeling when things are good, then we can start to notice more easily and quickly when we're starting to be less calm and when we're starting to feel disconnected, right? So many people don't notice that they're in trouble until they're maybe at a seven or eight on a scale of one to 10. And at that point, it might be too late to really center yourself well and be able to handle handle a situation without being so reactive. So the habits that we create when we're alone, when we're at a two or three, when things are going well, those habits for checking in, having conversations with ourselves around our sense of calm and our sense of connection, then are available to us when we're inching up into the four, five, six range. And that's the time that we are empowered to implement some behaviors that'll take us back down into a more calm, connected state. So we don't ever end up at an eight or nine. Mm. I love that. That is my absolute top tip for everyone is let's practice good check-ins, good self-awareness for being calm and connected throughout the day rather than waiting until we start to get into distress. Yeah, it remind it remind it reminds me of a situation that happened yesterday. I was traveling on the train back with mm. my my youngest daughter Eva and we we literally had I think we had like 12 minutes to get to the train station and we had an 8 minute walk and so it was quite stressful because we had mm. a couple of bags and I had to try mm. and be mindful of her but also really wanting to get this train. Um, And we ended up getting on the train. We're all hot and bothered and sweaty. And as the train opened, people piled on. And at the same point when I was about to put my bag on on a seat for for me and Eva, another lady did it. And it was like we had an exchange that, you know, Mm -hmm. I was like, she was like, oh, I was going to sit there with like six of like my friends. And I was like, well, I was just needing to get a seat for for my daughter, and like, I I felt like I I was because I was act, acting out of stress, and because it was mm-hmm. an intense situation, uh, and I thought, you know, I sat down, and as soon as I sat down, I kind of breathed, and then I was like, yeah, I probably could have been less prickly, like with that mm. with that woman. I had my daughter there as well, so I I also thought, you know, sometimes it's good to kind of show our children like when we need to like own something and maybe we weren't on or sure. I, was, I wasn't on point. So I just said to the lady, she, she, you know, she, she was a, uh, an old, an older lady to, to myself. And I just said, um, you know, I just want to apologize for mm-hmm. like the way that, that I came across. Um, it was very stressful uh, getting here. Uh, and she said, it's okay. We're, we're all stressed. And it was able to like resolve. So sometimes you know, with the best will in the world, Amy, you know, when we have these regular check-ins, like I do, I'm so like, often, I probably have too many check-ins where I'm probably the other (laughs) side of the scale, you know, where I'm analyzing everything. Mm -hmm. When, when when, When we are reactive, and then we have to then apologize, that's also important too, isn't it, as part of our own unraveling? Yeah, actually, the check-in is never judgmental Mm. to say I should be feeling different or I should be behaving differently. It's really to say, how am I and what do I need? You know, what would serve me well right now? Mm. Do I need to take a deep breath? Do I need a bigger drink of water? Do I need to go for a little walk? Or can I just do some you know, maybe maintain some good posture and smile at someone. Mm. So it's never to say that you're in the wrong. It's just to say what will serve me from this point, because part of your model for your daughter 
is to be real, to have a wide, you know, capacity for feeling the full range of emotion, and then to make a correction if you choose to, mm. but not because you have to, just because mm. you choose to be an in integrity of who you are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So those check-ins are a great time to remind ourselves that we're actually good right here, right now, even if we're feeling agitated, even if we have some anger we need to work through, mm. it's okay. It's really a an exercise in acceptance mm. to do those check-ins mm. and remember that we're never actually able to be more compassionate to others than we are to ourselves. Mm. So I was actually mentoring another coach a few days ago and she was actually, she, she was feeling a little guilty that she wasn't more compassionate towards someone she had been coaching. And we talked for just a minute about her self-talk and how compassionate she is to herself. And the light bulb went on for her that really what she gets to do is practice a little more compassion and acceptance of herself. And it will naturally exude to the folks that she's coaching. Yes. That's with self and then an expression out of that. We've only got a few moments, uh, Amy, but I do want to ask this because this is something that fascinated me. And I thought this is a, a moment where I feel like it may unlock or mm. or give a piece of the puzzle so i want you to talk to me for the next few minutes about the work of parenting mm. uh, specifically when you said take inventory of the impact of the way we were parented for me mm. that that's fascinating tell us a little bit about that and how, how that sure. works sure so taking this inventory of how we were parented is our way of looking at the resources that we're bringing to our relationships. The number one thing we bring to our relationships are beliefs about who we are, who our children are, and what they need from us. So if we can look at how we really see ourselves and what our children need, we're going to find out that our children need encouragement to manage their own lives. So many of us were parented with messages that we couldn't manage our own lives. In other words, we needed to be told what we were doing wrong. We needed to be told how to behave rather than asked what it is we're trying to accomplish. So as parents, if we can recognize the beliefs we have about what we, the messages that we got from our parents, and then ask ourselves, is that the same message or is there a different message that we want to give our children? Then we can align our behaviors as parents with what it is we really want our children to take away from their interactions with us. And most parents will say they want their children to be responsible independent and happy. And those are three qualities that we actually can't give our children, but we can allow our children to develop as we're, as we are there to give them feedback, give them great information, keep them really safe and be present. So we're there to help them process their own thoughts, feelings, and emotions as they grow toward independence, responsibility, and happiness. Amazing. Really good. Does that answer would, your question? Yeah. And it's something that I just feel like is very helpful and poignant and makes gives gives thought beyond even like this podcast to really think about that and how that unfolds. That's really, really helpful. It, it really comes full circle with aligning our behaviors with what it is we truly envision for ourselves and for others and creating habits that serve us rather than are just default habits that fall into place out of reactivity. Mm. Amy, how do people find out more about you? Where do they go? And uh, if you've got one little final thought, feel free to share it. Sure. I have two websites. One is the center for coach development.com. 
The other is the Center for Family Resolution. Dot com. And my final word to all of your audience is really just a sense of, of blessing. May you be well, may you feel safe, may you feel protected, may you enjoy your life and know that whatever it is that's still deep inside of you that needs healing, healing is absolutely possible. And anything that's troubling you is bubbling up to be healed never to cause suffering thank you amen it's beautiful thank you for joining this episode with me max sefton i hope you've really enjoyed it feel free to leave us a positive review on itunes and i look forward to welcoming you back to the next episode of the brains magazine podcast